special concern with the problem in Laos goes back to 1954. That year at Geneva, a large group of powers agreed to a settlement of the struggle for Indochina. Laos was one of the new states which had recently emerged from the French Union. And it was the clear premise of the 1954 settlement that this new country would be neutral, free of external domination by anyone. At the 1954 International Peace Conference in Geneva, Laos, along with Vietnam and Cambodia, finally gained independence from French rule. The catastrophic defeat of the French forces at Dien Bien Phu in northern Vietnam had signaled the end of nine years of bitter conflict. The drive for independence throughout French Indochina had proved too strong to be contained by force of arms. After the conference, the British Foreign Minister, Sir Anthony Eden, expressed the hope that Laos should remain as an independent and neutral buffer. It was therefore essential that the United States should not attempt to establish any military influence. But by 1954, it was already too late. The United States had viewed the war against the French as being more than just a struggle of local people for their independence. American foreign policy makers had cast those fighting for their freedom as simply puppets of the Soviet and Chinese communists thereby committing the whole region to a further 20 years of war. The United States had financed much of the French war effort, and in Washington, the Geneva settlement was viewed as a sellout to communism. It was Laos's geographic misfortune that it bordered all the region's other states, and by the late 1950s was seen by the US as the keystone of all Southeast Asia. For the incoming Kennedy administration, Laos was a front line of the free world. In March 1961, the young president devoted an entire press conference to the country, clearly signaling his anti-communist resolve. The security of all Southeast Asia will be endangered if Laos loses its neutral independence. Its own safety runs with the safety of us all, in real neutrality observed by all. I want to make it clear to the American people and to all the world that all we want in Laos is peace, not war. A truly neutral government, not a Cold War pawn. A settlement concluded at the conference table, and not on the battlefield. Our response will be made in close cooperation with our allies and the wishes of the Laotian government. We will not be provoked, trapped, or drawn into this or any other situation but I know that every American will want his country to honor its obligations to the point that freedom and security of the free world and ourselves may be achieved. At the same time, it was clear to the United States that a landlocked country such as Laos would be an extremely difficult place to fight a major ground war. For this, they had selected Vietnam as the right place to check communism. Shying away from direct confrontation, yet still committed to protecting Laos from what it saw as the communist threat, the Kennedy administration initiated a policy of massive covert military assistance to the Vientiane government. Laos was destined to become the site of a secret war of which the world would know little. Laos was a secret war because it was an embarrassment. The real problem was Laos itself. It was in the way of the Vietnam War. Uh, and of course nobody really knew where Laos was, what it was, who the people were. 
In none of the references to Laos, even when it was spoken about, did anybody give any indication that the Lao were more than a periphery to Vietnam and the problems of the United States. Not that they were an ancient and a beautiful culture all of their own, a culture that, that by rights, except for their own determination, should really have been wiped off the face of the earth by what the, the US forces did. In May 1964, US piloted fighter bombers attacked targets on the plain of Jars in northern Laos with napalm and 500 pound bombs. The air war had begun. Today, the plain of Jars still bears the marks of intense bombardment. A bombardment that haunts the imagination, not only because of its obvious intensity, but also because of its random, pointless nature. Vast grasslands and terrace paddies now resemble a man-made moonscape that reveals no logic or military significance. I'm now standing on the edge of a huge bomb crater that was probably created by something like a 3,000 pound bomb. Um, just driving up here today, it, it's one of many that still scarred the countryside some 20 years after the war finished. I and mean, it's at least 20 yards across. But beyond the physical scarring of the landscape lies a more threatening legacy. Unexploded bombs and bomblets still litter the environment, posing enormous dangers for the population and their livestock. The British-based charity, the Mines Advisory Group, or MAG as it's known, was established to respond to the impact of mines and unexploded ordnance on civilian communities worldwide. In Laos, its teams of local technicians and British ordnance experts have been working since 1994 to rid the plain of jars of its unexploded ordnance. Their work requires a high level of skill and careful planning. The lethal range of shrapnel from a 500-pound bomb, as in this case, is over half a mile, and the area has to be systematically evacuated and tightly sealed before a demolition can take place. What I've done is uh, I've just put a a charge in the back of the bomb, uh, some TNT and some plastic. That's going to detonate the main filling in the bomb. Well, this is one of the many pieces of shrapnel that's now littering this area. It's absolutely razor sharp and would have come away from that explosion at ballistic speed. It doesn't take much imagination to work out what that would do to a person. And the problem here was that Children such as this could have played with it, rolled it down the hill, and the results of their playful activity, their adventurous risk-taking, could have been devastating. As the war in neighboring Vietnam escalated in the mid-1960s, the importance of Laos to the North Vietnamese increased. Even during their struggle against the French, the North Vietnamese leader, Ho Chi Minh, had used Eastern Laos as a supply route to take men and munitions to the south. Now, this logistical pipeline became critical. From 1965 to 1973, the United States Air Force targeted the trail area in Eastern Laos with defoliants, airdrop landmines, bomblets, and larger bombs. Day and night, the trail was the scene of explosions, burning vehicles, wounded men and women, avalanches and forest fires. But the trail network was under constant repair. Incredibly, it was steadily improved and the flow of men and supplies to the south grew relentlessly each year. Strategically, the battle for the trail was the only one that really mattered in the Vietnam War, but the US Air Force failed to win it. More than 20 years later, a significant amount of the two million tons of ordnance dropped on the trail remains unexploded, buried in the soil or lying on the surface. <laughs> 